Okay, so moving away from urgent trauma and, and other uh, urgent ophthalmic conditions to more common and chronic conditions, that's what we'll be talking about today. So here they are in the curriculum. Um, there's really five conditions. Refractive error is kind of its own thing, which is why it's separate on the um, Venn diagram. And then primary open angle glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration and cataract you can think of them together because they're all age related and they're all tend to be slow degenerative conditions. Okay. Macular degeneration can present acutely. We'll talk about, I've actually talked about neovascular or wet macular degeneration in another lecture. That's an acute presentation. So today I'll be talking about earlier stages of macular degeneration, which you can call dry. Okay. And, uh, the other one is diabetic retinopathy. I'm not going to talk about that today. There's really five chronic conditions in ophthalmology. They're the big five. Are these four plus diabetic retinopathy? I'll talk about diabetic retinopathy. Pretty sure there's something online about that. Um, perhaps even a whole lecture. So just look at that for the diabetic retinopathy. So the usual sort of format, um, a bit of background and then the conditions and wrap up at the end. So Look, chronic eye conditions are common. Um, there's an ABS report from only a few years ago which suggested that over half the population have some chronic eye condition. That might just be a need for glasses, but it might be more serious than that. Mainly it's over 40 year olds, so my lucky age group. And most of it is preventable or treatable. So that's the, the good news. Um, there was a survey that was done, the most recent National Eye Health Survey, that's what that uh, NEHS is, showed that overall we had a 67% vision loss in Australia, which is really good by international standards, just reflects us being a developed economy, a rich country. Um, Indigenous people had almost three times that rate of vision loss. That was after adjusting for gender and age. So unfortunately, there's a gap in vision, like there's a gap in you know, many other parts of healthcare. And the leading causes are the five things that, are, that we just mentioned. So refractive error, need for glasses, cataract, macular degeneration, glaucoma, and uh, sorry, uh, diabetic retinopathy. Glaucoma is more of a leading cause internationally. It's one of the three leading causes internationally. It's, a, it's an important uh, condition in Australia, and that's why we'll talk about it today. Um, and this is just a, a diagram from that study by form in the National Eye Health Survey. So if you look at the blue area, that's all refractive error. So you can see most uh, vision loss can just be treated by glasses alone. So there's lots of people out there walking around without the glasses that they need. Um, then you've got cataract, more in indigenous compared to non-indigenous people. That's the, the pink slice. Um, and from there, uh, in non-Indigenous people, you've got age-related macular degeneration, making up 10% of vision loss. Uh, that's the third more, most leading cause. And then in Aboriginal people, this 8.1% is can't be determined. So then we look at this triangle here, and that's diabetic retinopathy. So that's relatively more important in Indigenous people compared to non-Indigenous. These are the stuff that ophthalmologists see day in, day out. This is the sort of bread and butter of ophthalmology, and it will definitely present to you as a GP or any medical specialist. You're going to see patients with these conditions. So what's happening internationally? We've talked about Australia, so 2.2, so almost a, well over a quarter of the world's population. So you see what I mean when I say Australia is, is well off. A quarter to a third of the world's population have some visual impairment, either distance vision or, or near vision or both. Uh, and at least half of this is avoidable. And the leading causes, as I mentioned, it's very similar to Australia, except glaucoma is bigger internationally. African people, people of African descent tend to be more affected by glaucoma. And often there's no screening or treatment available in many um, African states. Um, and then the other ones that we don't have so much in Australia are corneal opacity and trachoma, we used to have those, trachoma and corneal opacity, which kind of go together. Um, trachoma causes scarring of the eyelids and then your eyelashes 
rub on the cornea, the cornea becomes scarred. Other causes of corneal scarring are trauma and infection. So we don't tend to get those things so much anymore in Australia. We used to have lots of trachoma in the Aboriginal population. It's largely been um, eliminated through antibiotic distribution programs. Um, it still exists. It's not that there's none out there. There's just not very much, which is excellent for our public health system. Uh, so now let's talk about the, the conditions themselves. They can all be silent diseases, at least in the early stages. So patients often won't know that uh, they've got these conditions. So we, you know, definitely in primary healthcare, need to be aware that these are the common eye conditions, especially if there's a family history. So it's an important part of family. We're not asking about vision loss so much because you won't get much in the early stages. Family history will give you more information. Uh, early detection is the key to preventing vision loss. Therefore, regular eye screening is um, crucial. So as a part of general well-being for 40 plus year olds and for under 40 year olds if they've got a family history but definitely 40 plus year olds uh, don't forget eyes they often it often gets left out of sort of you know uh, well woman checks or well man checks if that's a thing uh, people need to be seeing either an ophthalmologist or an optometrist at least every couple of years for general screening because as i say most of these conditions are silent so what's your role? Uh, you can think of this as the learning objectives really for this lecture is to know what those conditions are. We've, we've just named them. Know the typical presentations of those conditions. Talk about those soon. Be able to give basic counseling and advice for each condition. So a patient goes, doctor, what's glaucoma? What's gonna happen? You can give them some basic information before they see the optometrist or the ophthalmologist. And then know when to refer and make an appropriate referral to the right person all right so we'll obviously go through all that, all that in a bit more detail now so this is me uh, i can relate to uh Ginny boy there's you know it's you can't put up images of refractive error you just put up pictures of people with glasses um like me so you know you can't tell someone has refractive error just by looking at them there's really nothing to see on examination unless you've got a retina scope or you know other instruments that we use to measure uh, refractive error um, so let's go back what is refractive error it's when light is focused inaccurately or it's not focused accurately at the back of the eye as it should be okay so light usually should fall in a focused um, circle or spot at the back of the eye on the macula and due to this size or shape of the eye or both of those things if the eye is too long too short or it's got an irregular shape the light's not going to be focused where it's supposed to be that's what refractive error is okay here are the types of refractive error i've covered these in an earlier lecture i think in the fundamentals introductory lecture so here's a the normal eye there's a light coming in it's refracted by the cornea and other elements of the eye refract light as well. Refract just means bend. They act to bend light so that all these parallel rays of light, which are bouncing off objects in the world, are focused onto a single spot on the macula. Okay. In myopia, short-sightedness like me, the eyeball is too long so that the focus ends up being in front of the retina. Either the eyeball is too long or the front part of the eye is too curved. So those refractive power goes up. When corneal curvature goes up, refractive power goes up. So it bends the light too much. That combination of long length and high corneal curvature is what results in myopia. Hypermetropia is the opposite. Hypermetropia is long-sided. So you can see well on the distance, but you can't see well up close. Myopes can't see well in the distance, can see well up close, okay? Myopia overall is more common in, in the community, especially now with screen use. So there's like an epidemic of myopia that's developing in children. And that old wife's tale about, you know, if you read too much, sit, close, sit too close to the TV, it's actually turning out to be true. So kids spending more time on screens is leading to higher rates of myopia. And part of the treatment is for kids uh, to, to be outdoors. And some of the clinicians at Lions Eye Institute have actually done some of the, the research on this. We'll talk about, I'll talk about that in a moment. So hypermetropia, 
eyeball relatively is shorter or the corneal curvature is less. So light rays aren't bent as much as they need to be and they, the focus ends up effectively being behind the retina. Myopia is treated with a concave lens. That's what I've got in my glasses. And that uh, acts to weaken the refractive power of the front part of the eye. It unbends the light, if you like, so that it's refracted less and ends up focusing more posteriorly. And hypermetropia is the opposite. It's corrected with a convex lens. Okay, that's the basic kind of stuff that you need to know. History-wise, look, my ops are going to have blurred vision at distance. They won't say I've got blurred vision at distance. They'll say I can't see number plates when I'm driving or I can't see the text on the screen as clearly as I used to, okay? Hyperopes who, hypermetropes who can't read, they don't have good near vision, they're gonna say I've got difficulty reading or I've got difficulty with a computer screen, right? They're the symptoms. And you can have both. You can have uh, myopia like me, but then start to lose your ability to accommodate. So you guys remember the accommodation reflex is what allows you to be able to focus up close. Once you get to 40 and older, you start to develop what's called presbyopia. Okay. So presbyopia is gradual loss of the accommodation reflex. And these people will have eye strain, which is discomfort, headache, or blurriness, often when they're at work because they're using screens. And uh, it comes on sometimes mid 30s, but definitely 40s onwards. So I am myopic and I'm starting to become presbyopic, which means without my glasses, I can't see in the distance and up close, I need a tiny prescription, whereas I didn't used to need that before. So you can have both. The etiology, we've talked about this, so axial length and quantum curvature, presbyopia is the loss of accommodation. Another type of refractive error is astigmatism. Just good to know that word and know what it means. Astigmatism, means that the curvature of the cornea, the front part of the eye, is not perfectly spherical like a soccer ball, which is what an anatomically perfect eye should be, right? The front curvature of the cornea should be perfectly spherical. In reality, most of us have some astigmatism, which means it's not perfectly like a soccer ball. One of the axes is a bit flatter or a bit more steep than the other axis. So the extreme of that, if you think about the soccer ball, the extreme of that is a footy. So a footy is long and pointed like a cone, right? So think of astigmatism as more like a footy and perfect anatomy is more like a, a soccer ball. And you can have myopia with astigmatism, hypermetropia with astigmatism. It's an additional type of refractive error. Examination wise, the basic thing you guys need to know is that you get improvement with pinhole correction. So whenever you do a visual acuity, if they're not getting six over six, you know, the bottom of the chart, you want to put a pinhole occluder up. And if they improve with pinhole occlusion, then they've got refractive error, okay? Uh, and if they normally wear distance glasses, you get them to keep their distance glasses on and put the pinhole over the glasses if they're not getting six, six. And if they see better than they did with their glasses, it means their prescription, whoop, their prescription probably needs to be updated. Right. So pinhole can be used with or without glasses. Management, well, obviously glasses and contact lenses. So optometry, if that's what's needed. Refractive surgery is an option for people that want it. Uh, that's people who don't want to wear contacts, don't want to wear glasses. So laser refractive surgery um, is suitable for some people, but not all. Uh, multiple factors there, and they need a consult with a refractive surgeon uh, to determine if they're eligible or not. Um, you guys need to be able to give driver's license advice. So if somebody is not achieving 612, 6 over 12, then, uh, you know, uh, and, and they need optical corrections, you know, they pinhole up to 6 over 9 or 6 over 6, let's say, then they need to have the need for optical corrections on their driver's license. And you need to be able to give that sort of advice, right? You don't call up the transport authority. Your role here is counseling and advice to the patient. So I've got that on my driver's license. Some more advice. So for press biopes, people who are struggling to, starting to struggle to read up close, there's what's called the 20-20-20 rule, which means every 20 minutes, you wanna look 20 feet in the distance, about six meters, <coughs> 
or about 20 seconds. And this is just a way of relaxing your accommodation reflex, which helps you then use it again as you go back to your computer or, or back to your desk. And good advice for everyone. You don't have to be over 40. The other thing is lubricating drops for press biopsies. Often they'll have a bit of dry eye as well. They're looking at the computer screen for a long time. Eyes are drying out, you know. So take a break and use lubricating drops. For kids, there's what's called a 2022 rule, which means that every day the two is for two hour uh, is for yeah two hours spent outdoor. So the, you know 20 feet still stands. You're outdoor. You're looking in the distance. Um, but the difference is you want them to be outdoors looking at the distance and with some exposure to UV because that's been shown to reduce the incidence of myopia. So that's where the old lifestyle comes in. There's also increasing research and evidence for the role of really low dose atropine. And again, some of the clinicians here at Lions Institute have been involved in this research. In kids, that's something for an ophthalmologist to, a pediatric ophthalmologist to administer. So kids developing myopia can see an optometrist for glasses and they can see an ophthalmologist for consideration of atropine treatment in some situations. Okay, so that's refractive error. And obviously refractive error can coexist with every other eye condition, okay? Now I'm gonna show you some images of people's lenses. So here we've got the slit beam on an angle and you're getting a cross section through the lens material. Okay, you're looking through the pupil and behind the pupil, you might remember is the natural lens of the eye. Its actions, uh, you know, its purpose is refraction to bend light. And in, you know, your eyes or most of your eyes, you should have a pretty clear lens. So the, so when you, when the, when you shine the light beam through the pupil, through the lens, you, it just, you know, this area looks black and this central area looks white. And you can do this on each other in the, in the eye clinic. If you compare it to this image here, I think you'll agree that it, this looks more yellowy and even green, okay? So this is what cataract looks like. Cataract is any opacity of the natural lens. Opacity just means not clear, right? Opposite of clear. So this is clear, this is not clear. The lens shouldn't have a color. When you shine a white light on it, you just see white light transecting the lens. Here's a very dense cataract. So the light is not even able to penetrate, it just reflects. And if a patient's got a cataract as dense as that, you don't even need the slip lamp to be able to see it. This is uncommon, particularly in metropolitan areas, a bit more common in, in uh, rural and remote areas where people have less access to cataract surgery. Usually, let's say, you'll be thinking about cataract surgery at this stage because this person will be starting to have diminished vision. This person will have very, very poor vision. They'll be cataract blind, basically. It's like looking through completely opaque material. This is just a different morphology of cataract. We call this cortical cataract because it's got these cortical spokes. And this type of cataract can cause more glare than blurriness. Okay, so. This is called a nuclear cataract. You don't need to know the subtypes. Just know that cataracts can present with different symptoms. The main one is blurred, diminishing vision, diminishing brightness, or slow and gradual over time. But some subtypes of cataract, including this one and this one, this is a post, what we call a posterior subcapsular cataract, which means the main opacity is on the back of the lens, not in the body of the lens, posterior. They cause more glare symptoms. So cataract patients can present with general blurriness and or glare, okay? They don't, it doesn't tend to be acute. Normally you're talking months to years. <coughs> Having said that, posterior subcapsular cataracts can be brought on quite rapidly by systemic steroid use and by diabetes. And those two things can cause quite fast development of posterior subcapsular cataracts. So glare over months, I would say, rather than months and months or years. Cataract, any opacity of the natural lens of the eye, most commonly caused by aging, there are other causes. Talk about those in a minute. So got some images of cataract surgery here. What is cataract surgery? It's removal of the natural lens in an anesthetized eye, usually under local anesthetic, patients sedated, but not put to sleep. And we use an ultrasonic probe called a phaco probe. 
The word laser is used out there in the community um, a lot. Laser can be used during cataract surgery. Most often it isn't. And it's not used to actually remove the, the lens. So think of cataract surgery as ultrasound technology rather than laser technology. Once you remove the lens, you pop in a new plastic lens, an artificial lens, which has the role of bending light, refracting light. And the lens is, uh, the power of that lens is tailored to the person's eye based on some measurements that we do. So they end up with the vision that they should have. Um, this is what it looks like when you're performing it. And the ophthalmologist will be looking down a microscope. So we use both hands and both feet and we use a microscope when we operate as well as the, the FACO device. If you get a chance, go to theater. Has anyone been to theater yeah, this time? Yeah, no reason you can't go. Just ask a registrar at least once. So look, history-wise, um, probably said most of this. So generally it's over 60 year olds can come on earlier, but that's the average age for cataract surgery in Australia is in the 70s, to give you an idea. Gradual blurring of um, distance vision. Often patients will say, my glasses seem smudged. I take them off and wipe them. Vision is still smudged. Another symptom you can get with cataracts is what's called second sight. So, you know, the action of the lens is to refract light or bend light. As cataracts worsen, the lens gets thicker and thicker. So it's bending light more and more, which is what you need for near vision. Okay. You need to refract light more in, a, in, in order to be able to see up closely. So as your cataract gets thicker, paradoxically, you're able to read better than you used to be able to read, if that makes sense. So a person can say, look, for a few years, my distance vision has been deteriorating, but strangely enough, I can read without reading glasses, whereas I used to need reading glasses more. That's a sort of typical um, cataract progression. They can give glare, as I said, you can get monocular diplopia from some types of cataract as well. So that means I've got diplopia, I close one eye, I've still got diplopia. So it's caused by one eye. I shut the eye that's responsible and the diplopia is gone, right? So diplopia caused by one eye, cataract is a cause of that. Not common, that's not common. Glare and blurring are more common. Etiology, mainly related to age. So you get age-related protein denaturation of the normal fibers of the natural lens that I talked about. There are many other causes. What's the most relevant one to you guys? Probably steroid related. So if someone's gonna be on steroids for a while, systemic steroids, I'd say months, not weeks. Weeks generally isn't gonna do it. Then you need to be aware of steroid induced cataract as a possible side effect. And then people with diabetes get cataracts earlier than non-diabetics. Examination-wise, we, we've seen the pictures, it progresses from clear to yellowish, to brown, to dark brown, and then can be eventually white, okay? And on the sleep lamp, when you look, I mean, if you get a chance in clinic, see if you can see one or two subtypes of, of cataract, that's not crucial. Um, Management-wise, you wanna address the refractive error first. Because often patients will say, my vision is deteriorating. Yes, they're 70. Oh, when were your glasses last updated? Five years ago. Okay, well, go to the optometrist first. Let's see what we can get your vision up to. You might be fine for another five years, right? And dry eye itself um, can definitely cause blurring. So glasses plus lubricating drops, a lot of people that'll defer surgery for a couple of years. When people do need it, as I mentioned, day surgery, Local anesthetic with sedation, that's what LAS stands for, not laser. Um, it's painless, it's sequential, which means we do one eye and then often a couple of weeks later or a month later, we do the other eye, depending on where the person lives. Success rate is high, 90%. Many of us will quote 98, 99% success, meaning a measurable improvement in vision. And the recovery is usually days to weeks, not months for routine cataract surgery. Dry eye symptoms are really common post-operatively. So if you're seeing a patient who recently had cataract surgery in your practice, they're like, oh, my eye's itchy or it feels gritty. It's probably dry and that's a common post-op problem. They should be on a lubricating drop. You can give them one if they're not on one um, already. And they may still need glasses. So patients need to be told, look, you might still need a small prescription for long distance vision. Um, and many patients will still need glasses for reading. 
So it's not a magic uh, sort of cure for never having to wear glasses again. A lot of patients will not need glasses, but um, it's an unrealistic expectation in the community that I have cataract surgery, I'll never need glasses again. Well, maybe, but it's very case by case because it depends on their refractive error. It depends on that person's occupation and hobbies, their normal activities. So just a, the blanket advice is you might still need specs after the surgery, but your vision with glasses will be better than what it was before. So that's cataract. And I would say it's the most fun part of my job, cataract surgery. It's fantastic. It's really meditative. You have to be really focused. There's a small uh, room for error. And even though an operation can be relatively quick, let's say 10 minutes, 10 to 15 is probably the average. It's a bit like walking a tightrope because uh, the complication that we all fear is if your phaco probe or any instrument hits the posterior capsule that the lens sits in, the natural lens, the whole lens can fall into the vitreous and that person then needs a second operation at a tertiary hospital. And the outcome then becomes, the recovery is gonna be longer for sure and you're gonna be less confident about that. But they still do well, most of them, but that's probably our most feared um, complication. And we're talking millimeters. The average lens is probably four millimeters thick. So your phaco probe is working in a space of one to two millimeters under a microscope. So if someone says, oh, cataract surgery, that's quick and easy, tell them no. Yes, I'm told it's different. <laughs> most patients don't have a capsule rupture, just so you know. Okay, um, moving on. Picture of two optic nerves. I think you'll agree with me that they look asymmetric. Okay. Here's what we call the optic cup, and the tissue around it is called the op is called the optic rim. Okay. So this is nerve tissue, and this is like a hollow space essentially. Uh, the whole thing is the head of the optic nerve. Obviously, that's the optic disc. So there's the cup. There's the disc. You guys will be familiar with the term cup disc ratio. This person has a much higher cup disc ratio than this one, or this eye. They might both belong to the same person. This cup disc ratio, I'd say, is about 0.5, thereabouts. This one's closer to 0 0.8, 0 0.9, okay? And here are the visual field test results that typically correspond with this sort of optic nerve. So in the early stages, and this is glaucoma, just to um, let you know, Glaucoma ends up with optic disc cupping. Glaucoma patients end up with cupped optic discs if they're not treated, okay? They're losing neuroretinal rim tissue. They're losing nerve tissue. That's what glaucoma does. So it's a progressive loss of nerve tissue. Ganglion cell layer axons is, is what you're losing. And so it's a progressive optic neuropathy. It's the most common progressive chronic optic neuropathy out there in the community. And it leads to peripheral visual field loss. Initially peripheral, you can get central too, for sure. And um, often it starts with superior field loss. And if it's not treated, it ends in tunnel vision. This is what the patient experiences. So we don't get so much of this in Australia. You don't see so many patients um, with tunnel vision. That's uncommon, more common overseas. But as you can imagine, you want to be catching people here. And that's why eye screening is um, important. So it's a group of conditions, really. Glaucoma is, uh, there's many types of glaucoma. I'm going to be talking about one type today, the most common type. That's one I want you to be aware of. Often it's linked to increased intraocular pressure, but not always. You can have normal tension, what's called normal tension glaucoma. So intraocular pressure is not the be all and end all, but it's, it's the single most important modifiable risk factor. Here's some images again of cup and disc. So, you know, we need you guys to be able to look at these sorts of images and just understand what's a normal-ish cup disc ratio, this one here, and what looks like a higher cup disc ratio. And this is not because you'll be using an ophthalmoscope to diagnose glaucoma so much. That's really not going to be your role as non-eye specialists. It's more so you've got an understanding of the disease. So if you've got a patient with glaucoma, you can in basic terms, explain to them what they've got. Here's some uh, newer treatments for glaucoma that are out there. This particular one was 
the culmination of 20 years of work by Professor Bill Morgan. He's one of the ophthalmologists at Lyons Eye Institute. 20 years of research has led to this commercially available implant, which is stuck into the drainage angle of the anterior chamber. You guys might remember you get aqueous humor forming here, okay, in the posterior chamber. It comes through the pupil into the, it fills the anterior chamber and then drains into the angle and from there into the trabecular meshwork. It's a problem with drainage that causes glaucoma. That's the primary problem with glaucoma, drainage of aqueous humor from the anterior chamber. So the treatments or the surgeries that are available improve that drainage. And this is one of them. This is called a Zen implant, but you can think of it as a glaucoma drainage device. That's the umbrella term, glaucoma and drainage device. And, that, and this is how it's inserted with a needle during surgery. Let's go back a couple of steps though. So glaucoma, usually asymptomatic, might present late with field constriction, but that's rare. Um, often there's a family history, not always. Uh, old, you know, middle-aged and older patients. Other risk factors, obstruct obstructive sleep apnea, diabetes, and myopia. Diabetes always comes up, unfortunately. Um, the main ones there are age and family history, I would say, if you can uh, remember those two. Etiology, reduced aqueous outflow. So a problem with outflow of aqueous and often raised intraocular pressure, okay, consequently. And as a result, you get alterations to the perfusion of the optic nerve head and you get progressive loss of uh, neural cells in the retina. They're called ganglion cells, right? So examination-wise, normal intraocular pressure, 10 to 21. That's the number that we always quote. So anything above 21. In reality, many people between 20 and 25, that's just normal intraocular pressure for them, but they may need to be monitored as glaucoma suspects, right? So we just watch their optic discs and their anatomy for a while to see if there's any progression. But to have definite glaucoma or primary open angle glaucoma, you want to raise intraocular pressure. You want to demonstrate some visual field loss and cupping of the optic disc over time. So two years from now, it's more cupped than it was today, let's say. So you need serial measurements to determine that. In reality, the diagnosis of glaucoma is becoming more sophisticated so that you don't need to demonstrate field loss. We've got devices now, ocular imaging, that can pick up really early ganglion cell layer loss. So we can have super early detection, which is excellent for patients. But for your purposes, high intraocular pressure, field loss, altered optic nerve, you know, cup disc ratio. With, in primary open angle, un, unlike um, acute angle closure, you remember in acute angle closure, you've got a shallow anterior chamber so the drainage angle blocks off altogether. Fluid can't leave at all, pressure goes through the roof, it's very painful. In primary open angle glaucoma, your, your angle appears open, right? It's just not draining correctly for various reasons. So the anterior chamber depth is normal. Uh, and if you compare one eye with the other, and if you compare it with yourself or a friend, the, the anterior chamber depth all looks pretty normal. In angle closure, that's not the case. Management-wise, well, you want screening um, in at-risk patients every one or two years. And as I said earlier, I think for over 40-year-olds, most people should be seeing an optometrist every one or two years anyway for general screening, and many of them will need glasses by that age. <coughs> Treatment-wise, once you've got confirmed glaucoma, there's four classes of pressure-lowering drops. And we'd just like you to, to know what those four classes are because... As a general doctor, you very likely will have a patient at some point who's on one of these drops and you'll see it on their medication list. So you need to have some familiarity. So they are beta blockers, prostaglandin analogs, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and alpha agonists, okay? And I've put in there the name of the most common drop for each of those classes. We're not gonna grill you on the names, but it's just good to know what the classes are. And their actions are either to reduce aqueous production or improve aqueous outflow. And I don't need you to know the mechanism of action for each class. Just know that overall, we're either trying to reduce production of fluid or improve the outflow of fluid. If drops alone aren't sufficient, and sometimes instead of drops, um, we'll do laser, what's called SLT laser. So this is different to all the other laser we talk about. It's not laser refractive surgery. 
it's actually the trabecular meshwork, you know, where the aqueous drains into that we, that we laser in order to increase its ability to pump fluid out. So SLT laser can be done as an outpatient procedure in clinic. If that doesn't work and drops haven't worked, then you create a mechanical drain for fluid with what's called trabeculectomy surgery, or as I said earlier, glau glaucoma drainage devices like the one in this image. So one way or another, you're trying to get fluid out. And that's the, they're the principles to, to managing glaucoma. Any questions on any of this so far? No, okay. All right, moving on, next case. You might remember that in one of my earlier lectures, probably the fundamentals one, I say that when you see photographs of the fundus, you wanna identify which eye it is, left or right. The nerve is nasal, so use that as your guide. The, your other guide is the optic nerve looks yellow and it's round. Blood vessels are red and they emanate from the optic disc. Retinal tissue is orange and it should be in between um, the blood vessels. So in a healthy eye, all you should see is yellow disc, red blood vessels, intervening orange tissue. Anything in addition to that, for your purposes, you can consider abnormal. So if you were to see photos like this, I'd want your eyes to immediately go to these specks of yellow, okay? The cue or the trigger for this patient would be, this is a 75 year old patient, right? And you could ask, do they have diabetes? No. So the yellow stuff is not hard exudates. That's a common thing we get in OSCEs. Oh, they could be hard exudates, but the person doesn't have diabetes. So, you know, we don't want you to go down that track. Older person with yellow deposits at the back of the eye, that's macular degeneration, okay? And the yellow deposits are called drusen. They're little deposits of protein and fat, essentially, at the back of the eye that are waste products that are not being adequately pumped out of the retina because the ability of the retina to pump out waste products goes down as you get older. That's no surprise, right? So drusen are often the first visible signs of macular degeneration. It's age-related, so yes, surprise, that happens in older patients. Progressive degeneration, and the language that's used out there in community is wear and tear. You've got wear and tear of your macula. What's the macula? The macula is the central part of the retina, okay? So our patients often say, doctor, do I have macula? And the answer is yes. If you have an eyeball, you have a macula. Everybody's got a macula, right? The question, what they're really asking is, do I have macular degeneration? Um, and you need to look into their eye to, you know, to be able to answer that question. When it causes symptoms, it affects central vision. So let's talk about the history now. So you get gradual central visual blurring. Now, how do you differentiate macular degeneration from cataract? because both of them are causing gradual visual blurring. Well, the answer is sometimes it's difficult, okay? But there are some things which macular degeneration does, which cataract does not. Cataract does not give you distortion. Distortion means a straight line look, starts to look wavy, okay? So wet macular degeneration can do this too, can give you distortion, but wet or neovascular macular degeneration does that quickly, does that in days to weeks. Uh, the earlier stages of macular degeneration take months and years to cause that sort of distortion. The other thing you get is what we call prolonged dark adaptation. So patient doesn't say, doctor, I've got prolonged dark adaptation. What they say is when I drive my car into the underground parking, uh, I don't feel safe. I can't see, right? It takes a really long time to adapt to the, to the light in the underground car park. Or they say, I come indoors from outdoors, can't see for a while. They're the sort of typical symptoms, or I don't like night driving anymore, you know, because they've lost rod photoreceptors, right? So their vision in the dark is poorer. You remember rods do black and white, so more important for night vision. Um, that's a sort of typical history, and obviously older patient, right? 60 plus, if not 70 plus. Smoking is the most important modifiable risk factor here. So you wanna ask if they smoke. The other one is a family history. So remember those two. Are you a smoker? Is anyone in your family? Having a family history incre increases the likelihood of having macular degeneration. Um, and there are associations with metabolic cardiovascular disease as well. Obesity, cardiovascular disease, increase the risk. Etiology is outer retinal degeneration. The outer retina is what's responsible for pumping 
waste products out. Uh, and that leads to drusen formation and loss of photoreceptors ultimately, um, which is why you start to lose vision. Drusen we've spoken about. You can also get pigment deposits. So yellow spots are abnormal, black spots are abnormal. And you can get yellow and black at the back of the eye. So we might give you an image in your OSCE, old patient, older, um, yellow deposits, as well as some black deposits. Don't be surprised if you see black in there. If you see red in amongst all that, right, that's blood. So now you're thinking neovascular age-related macular degeneration. If you don't see, and the history will go with that. This will be, oh, it's about two weeks, let's say. This history will be months to years, right? Uh, Management-wise, yeah, look, non-neovascular, non macular degeneration. So the earlier forms, dry. Dry is actually not the correct term. I'm using it here, but we call uh, the image that I just showed you, we'd call that intermediate age-related macular degeneration because you can have advanced macular degeneration that is causing blindness, but is not exudative because the macula becomes atrophic, right? So these days we say early, intermediate and advanced or late. And late or advanced can be neovascular or non neovascular. Don't worry about that. Okay. <laughs> For your purposes, wet and dry is okay. Just know that someone can be blind from macular degeneration, but it's actually dry. And there's no treatment available at the moment, although there are drugs potentially in the pipeline um, that are coming out of clinical trials now. So, coming back from all that, Earlier stages of macular degeneration, what's the management? It's conservative. The aim of the game is to slow it down. So you want to slow down progression to loss of vision. And the evidence is that it can be slowed down by 50% or more, which is significant for someone who's 70. They might retain decent vision until they pass, right? Uh, mainstays here are a diet that's rich in green leafy vegetables, antioxidants, and healthy fatty acids. And... So you can concoct a diet that way, but the cultural diet that's been shown to do that the most is what's called the Mediterranean diet. A lot of, lot of literature on this now. So Mediterranean diet in parts of Western Europe uh, has been shown to slow the progression of macular degeneration by 40 something percent, okay? There are over-the-counter supplements as well. Um, you'll see them if you look for them in a pharmacy. They've been shown to slow down the progression by 20 something percent. So my advice to patients is if you've got a good diet, this stuff is better absorbed from food than it is from a tablet. Most of what you have from a tablet, you'll will end up in the toilet getting peed out. And so don't worry about wasting your money on supplements if you're able to have a good diet. Occasionally a patient will, will say, no, I'm not gonna eat that, a good diet. I'm not interested. Then take the supplement. So the advice is try and have a good diet and Mediterranean diet, those sorts of principles. And if you, if you don't like that idea, then supplements are okay. They've been shown to be effective. But the other thing is self-monitoring. And uh, so if you look for these in the eye clinic, you'll see them. This is a traditional way that people with macular degeneration uh, monitor their vision at home. What they're really monitoring for is new distortion or a new scotoma which is dry macular degeneration changing to wet, right? That's the point of this monitoring is, yes, we know I've got dry. I want to catch the progression to wet as soon as it happens because the, the sooner wet is caught and treated, the better the long-term visual outcome. That's the point of self-monitoring. And you don't have to use this grid chart. They can use a straight line or a pattern that they've got at home that has straight lines in it, okay? Smoking cessation is the other one. I said that smoking is the most important, the single most important modifiable risk factor for AMD as it is for most things. UV protection. So the sort of cancer council polarized sunnies are probably the best ones because they've got protection at the front and on the side. They look kind of dorky, but your 70 plus year olds normally don't care by that stage. Um, physical activity has been shown to reduce progression of macular degeneration. Uh, as has optimizing cardiovascular. So it's really, it's the best overall general health, which is not, a, you know, the eyes part of the body. 
self-monitoring we talked about, and then over-the-counter supplements I've, I've mentioned as well. Okay, wow, all right, that ended quicker than I thought it would. There are your five conditions. Diabetic retinopathy, please look at the other lecture. Definitely examine a more big public health problem and, and it's only increasing in incidence and prevalence. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you can because if you've got bad enough vascular leakage to be giving you heart exudates, what that means is there's cholesterol and protein leaking out of blood vessels, right? There's going to be blood leaking out too. So in uh, an eye with heart exudates, you'll see microaneurysms, tiny little dot, um, red dots, and you'll see bigger red blotches at the back of the eye. We used to call those dot and blot hemorrhages, right? So if you're not sure and there's no history, then look for blood. That's the answer. Now, you can have macular degeneration with drusen, that's in your vascular, and you've also got blood. But in macular degeneration, the blood tends to be more central, right in the center of the macula, whereas in diabetes, it tends to be everywhere. Um, and also in macular degeneration, it's more localized. So you've just got a single, normally just a single spot of blood. If we were gonna give you an image, that's the kind of image we'd give you. The final thing is, if you've got diabetic retinopathy, it tends to be fairly symmetric. So you'll have heart exudates here, heart exudates here, blood in both eyes. In macular degeneration, you'll have drusen here, drusen here, usually blood only in one eye if you're going to have blood. So the differentiating thing is blood. If they've, and if it's got blood, look for bilaterality and whether it's right in the middle or all over. It's a very long-winded answer. <laughs> Makes sense? Yep, good. <laughs> Other questions? No. Does anyone know anyone with glaucoma? macular degeneration yes yeah you've got it you just your parents their grandparents glaucoma or amd okay she takes drops wow okay that, oh wow amazing yep um still sad that she's lost vision or if it was from glaucoma it might have been from something else Okay, so just to reiterate, guys, you need to know the conditions, know the typical history, basic counseling advice, and who and when to refer. Everybody gets screened. Thank you for listening.